Hello, this is Adrian of the Freakish Lemon Podcast. I use masculine pronouns, and we're doing something a little different today. I talked last summer about doing dedicated videos for projects, a la all the costume YouTubers out there, and I've been trying, and that's not going well. My motivation to keep those up is not good. <laughs> I'm trashing one of them. The only one that I'm planning on actually completing is the um, machine knitting sweater hand knitting pattern to machine knitting conversion thing that I started. Um, just not motivated to keep up those projects long term because I'm slow and it takes me forever to do things. So I thought maybe we should try some vlog style videos for what's going on in the craft room. It's a little hard to talk about techniques I might be using and stuff for sewing on the regular podcast because I'm usually just kind of doing all the things at once on the weekend and not necessarily breaking it down in a coherent manner in the podcast, so we'll try some vlog style stuff. So today is Saturday, March 7th, and this is the state of the craft room today. The only thing I've done this morning, which I will have shown you, is I did some spinning on my Ashford Kiwi 2 wheel over there. Um, I really got distracted this morning dealing with, uh, scrap fabric. That is fabric that needs to be donated, but I was shredding cabbage, uh, as they say in the cost tuber biz. I filled up this plastic bag with shredded scraps. I have scrap wool bits that I'm not really interested in spinning because they're like leftover stuff that came off the drum carter. And I filled up, well not filled up, I put a bunch of scrap stuff in this Ziploc bag too. So they're in this giant underbed garment bag situation. Um, I need two hands to get that back in. So I spent basically all of my morning doing that and then reorganizing some of my this corner uh, because I shuffled around some fabrics. I got my scrap bin. This is a garbage can from Ikea. I throw my scraps in there until I want to deal with them. Um, that kind of took up my whole morning, which I didn't intend. So things on the to-do list for this weekend, which may or may not get done. Frog this sweater. This is a fingering weight machine knit sweater that's covered in dog hair, even though it's freshly washed. Um, I just don't wear it. This hits me at a weird point and the front is too short. The back is the perfect length, the front is too short, so it fits me weird. I have a pattern from Susan Guayumi um, for a machine knit yoke sweater that I want to try, so I figure I will rip this out and um, try out that sweater pattern using this yarn so I'm not busting into new stash for an experiment. I have this bin of things that need to be washed and blocked. I have hand spun, more hand spun, a swatch for a new machine knit, oops, cotton sweater project, more hand spun. The final two pieces of that machine knit sweater that I've been working on for ages that's in that basket over there. So those things need to get washed and blocked. Here I have t-shirt carnage. So I have, what's the name of this pattern? It's the Liesl & Co. Men's Metro t-shirt with my slight adjustments uh, to fit me. Hello, there we go. Uh, I have these two, this Halloween one and this stripey one that are mostly finished. I just need to do the 
hem and cuffs. I, I, they're all pinned, they just need to be sewn. And then I have all the pieces cut for this gray one and this Star Wars kind of burgundy fabric. And I have to put that drill somewhere because it's done charging. I also have this. This is my newest weaving project. This is going to be, well, I mean, it is. You can see it. I've done the warp. I need to slay it through the reed. You can see I've got the two strands here, so one of these strands needs to go into the hole. Um, it's going to be, hopefully, a pretty cool effect because the black and gray is a gradient and it's going to be a red and black, red and gray hound's tooth pattern with a partially gradient warp, which I think will be neat, but I need to spend some time poking yarn through holes. Is there anything else? Just do a quick pan so there's nothing else I'm missing. No, I think that's it for now. Um, yeah, so that's on the to-do list because I can't do anything with that machine or that machine until I have... I can't do any... I don't have projects for this machine right now because I need that cotton swatch to be washed so I can measure it. And this machine's not doing anything until I frog that sweater so that I can do the yoked sweater experiment because that is a giant swatch. And also I still have the swatch from last time. So that's what needs to get done at some point this weekend.
so started hemming this shirt and I'm gonna be in seam ripper land for a while because while going over the side seam it got stuck and I had to cut it out. Now, luckily, this shirt is long enough that I can just fold up an inch instead of the half inch. Um, so that hole won't be a problem. But I did so like the whole back. And it takes a long time to see rip knit fabrics. So I have no idea if any of these shirts are going to be done today. So checking back in, it is almost 7.30. I have finished dealing with this Halloween shirt and it is complete. Um, so that's that shirt and uh, the additional hem take up to deal with that hole um, actually ended up working really well because I tried this shirt on over this shirt and it's longer. I don't know how that happened, um, but I did finish this shirt. I finished this shirt and I finished this shirt. Um, I was doing these first two at the same time because I was using the same black thread for both of them. Had to switch over to the gray thread for the gray shirt. I just finished that and since it's 7.30 I'm not gonna start on the last shirt because I have to change out the thread again. Um, to this burgundy type color for this Star Wars shirt. So I'm not gonna deal with that tonight. Um, Maybe I'll fill up the bobbin and just get the machine threaded so it's ready to go. I did finish slaying the loom and started the project on there. Already there are mistakes in it. I am not a very careful weaver, which is something I need to work on. Um, but that's started and I always build in a lot of extra in my weaving stuff. I don't have an exact plan for this, but I have a kind of generalized idea for what I wanted to do for this, so there should be plenty of extra if I need to just lop that bit off, but there's always mistakes in my weaving, always, so I'm not that worried about it. Um, I got that done. The washing and blocking I got done. I did frog that sweater. That yarn is still in a tub of water. I need to deal with that tonight. And I think that was most of the stuff I was planning on doing this weekend. So good job me for doing that. But that's gonna really do it for this weekend. Um, I don't know what the rest of this week is gonna look like in terms of vlogging, but I suppose I'll update you when I do some vlogging then. Hello, um, killing time before uh, Gabby's uh, wedding setup and rehearsal dinner. So I thought I'd show you the uh, quick and dirty way that I measure my hand spun skeins because I'm not great at measuring yardage accurately. So I'm just gonna wing it. What I do is I stick one finger in each side of the skein and then I put my fingers, one on zero, 
And one is here on, uh, I don't pull it taut, but I pull it, you know, about where there's starting to be tension. So that's 22. 22 inches. Times two, because it's a loop. Oops. So that's 44 inches around the loop. And then I just count how many strands are in a loop. Or in the loop, I should say. Four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, seventy-two. So I have 44 inches times 72, 3168, and then I divide that by 36, which is how many inches are in a yard, which is 88 yards. So that's my approximate length measurement. Is that exactly what the skein comes out to? Not on your life. Uh, is that close enough to be able to figure out if I need 88 yards of a thing? Um, in a project? Probably. Um, yeah, it, I find it difficult to measure these skeins accurately anyway, because there's always incomplete circuits around the skein, so that's my quick and dirty method of getting an approximate measurement. Just two fingers on each side, measure it, times two, times the number of strands, divided by 36. So here's an example of what, mm, if it'll focus, there we go. That's an example of what my tags look like. A generic name for the yarn, yards, grams, wraps per inch. And I don't even unravel it from the, uh, skein. I'll just grab a bunch, stick them in my wraps per inch tool and see, you know, how many comfortably fit. Yeah, we can get one more in there. And that's how I measure my wraps per inch, because uh, that'll give me a sampling along the whole skein, not just perhaps I spun very thin at one end and not very thin at the other. Because um, I'm not a controlled spinner. Am I crooked? Eh, who cares? Hi, uh, it is Saturday, March uh, 21st. Um, it sure has been a week, hasn't it? Um, if you're watching this in the future, uh, this is the first week of real serious coronavirus lockdown stuff here in the U.S. Um, just as an update for all of you, I do work in a job that I can work from home and we got the go-ahead to work at home full-time uh, Tuesday of this week. <laughs> um, I was out with a sinus infection because my body has great timing, um, but it is just a sinus infection. Got checked out by a doc. I'm on antibiotics. We're all good. Um, so, yeah, it's sort of quarantine times now, uh, which, in terms of these vlogs and the podcast, uh, means that um, one, I get an extra hour's sleep every morning, even on work days, which is great, because uh, I don't have to get up early to get prepped and ready to go. Um, and also that means I'm reclaiming two to three hours of commute time every work day. And I'm sorry if you can hear my brother through the door. He's very loud. <laughs> and I'm trying not to carry across the house because we are all home. Um, yeah, um, so that means, um, 
I think I'm going to put a hold on the regular podcast for now since I'm going to have the opportunity to work more on the things that are in this craft room that are difficult to show on the podcast until they're finished. Um, I'll probably, <clears throat> sorry, still a little congested, you can probably hear that. Um, I'll probably film like a, a knitting roundup thing uh, in my room sometime this weekend just to show you where I am with those uh, hand knitting projects. Um, but uh, yeah, I'm not gonna go crazy and burn myself out here in the craft room. There will be a lot of naps in my future, which I'm really looking forward to. Um, and just generally taking it easy, consuming the media that I haven't had a chance to see, like all the episodes of the new season of Clone Wars. I just haven't seen them yet. Ugh, um, but yeah, so there's gonna I'm, I'm gonna go vlog style for a while since um, that's really gonna be the the thing to do at the moment that I feel. Yeah. So let's take you down off the tripod and show you what's been going on in this craft room um, since the wedding. Um, Oh, speaking of the wedding, I know people wanted to see what I made for the wedding. I have to do laundry. So <laughs> once that's done, uh, I'll show you the um, the things I made and talk about things that I would change or whatever. Um, I'll give you the rundown once everything's washed. <laughs> so um, for now, let's see what's going on in the craft room. So starting from the entrance to the craft room, I have successfully frogged, washed, and re-caked up the yarn from that sweater that I never wear. Um, so that is ready to go. I'm going to be doing do 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 um, a machine knit yoke sweater. This is a pattern by let's focus on her name. Susan Guayumi, I believe is how you pronounce that. Um, if you go to her website and sign up for her newsletter, Refocus Camera, uh, she gives you access to a bunch of her machine knit patterns and techniques and all sorts of stuff, uh, including a blog post about machine knit yoke sweaters, and she has a, a pretty basic machine knit yoke sweater pattern that you can work from, uh, basically. Um, I believe it was supposed to come with a punch card for patterning. Um, the scan doesn't have that, but I figure I'll just do it in plain stackinette to get used to rehanging re it. Because there are, like, he, this is for a cardigan, actually. Um, but, like, where you rehang the yoke and when, and how you overlap, and deal with seams, and all that kind of stuff. I figure it's a good practice. Just do it in stockinette. Just change colors on the yoke. Um, and probably the sleeve cuffs, because I'm not sure how much of each of those kinds of yarn I have. I know I have more of the black. Uh, this is just nitpicks stroll fingering, so I know I have more of this. But I'd rather not break into any new skeins if I don't have to, so... And I do know I have more of this, but it's planned for another project, so I just kind of want to keep this contained. <laughs> just keep the sweater more or less what I've got there. Uh, and then over here, we have some more results from my plying party. Um, just skeins and skeins. So they're just getting dumped in this tub here for now. I suppose a craft I could mention. This is a sewing machine cover that I made for a sewing machine, ooh, long time ago. Probably when I first started the podcast, or just before I started the podcast, actually. Um, my Singer sewing machine uh, has problems with it, so I've actually packed that away into this carry case here. Uh, with a note saying what's wrong with it so that uh, 
hopefully after the worst of the worst of the pandemic has has uh passed and when we're on the road to societal recovery i can take that in somewhere hopefully and get it fixed but that meant that i wanted to put this cover on this machine and i had at some point because of the weird bed thing I made, uh, I had tacked up this extra hem bit so that it was the height of this on the other machine, more or less. So I just let out that seam on this and uh, pinked all the seams inside this thing because they were janky AF. Uh, <laughs> So this is one of the, this is an early sewing project. I pressed out all the seams and everything just, you know, to keep dust off of this lovely machine. Um, this is the actual cover for it, but I'm at this point, I'm just leaving this machine plugged in all the time. So I don't want to unplug it, replug it in to take that on and off. Uh, this has been my focus. Yeah, if we can see it because light. This is the Redford sweater by Julie Hoover that I'm doing a video on. Uh, doing a machine knit project from a hand knitting pattern and I'm in tricky seeming land. Um, I'll talk about this more in the video, but because of the construction of this sweater, I'll show you the other side that's finished. Um, for lots of seamed set and sleeve sweaters, you would not do the side seam and so you line up the end the middle the other end seam around the shoulder and then you would seam the sleeve and the side seam together but because of the construction of this sweater there is a side panel so you can't do that <laughs> so you have to full-on set in your sleeve um, which is kind of slow going uh, because I have to keep checking to make sure it's not horrendously pulling weird. Um, and in some places, like here, at this join, there's a lot of yarn to go through, so you don't want to make it too bulky, but you also want to keep it secure. Uh, also, you cannot pull on this yarn very hard because it will snap. Ask me how I know that. <laughs> So I am working on that, and yarn chicken man, this is all the yarn that I have left. I need to knit cuffs and a collar, still. I mean, cuffs can be short, I'm gonna do the collar first, um, and then just whatever I have left will end up in cuffs, basically, uh, because I don't really wanna rip out my two swatches, because they will be extremely useful if I use this yarn again in this machine. So, yeah. Um, this is also a priority, just so I can get it off my list of things to do. This is the last long sleeve shirt um, that I need to do, but it kind of got pushed to the wayside because of this project down here. <coughs> You may have seen it on my Instagram stories, but uh, after my sister's wedding, we brought home her bouquet and the roses immediately started dying. So uh, we are drying out her bouquet for her. So all of the important flowers, the roses, the thistles, the, I don't know what they're called, but they're like red plumy things are all in here. These are packed with silica gel sand to dry them out. They're being mummified. Um, also, my mom's corsage and my dad's corsa corsage are in here. Um, so this is full of silica gel. This is full of silica gel. I put a couple of these guys just on top to see what would happen with them. Um, everything's supposed to be completely covered, but we ran out of silica gel by this point. Because um, that is also full of flowers and well herbs mostly uh it's full of plants from her bouquet there were a lot of plants so uh if anybody is planning on drying out a bouquet 
I used eight bags of silica gel sand plus these silica gel beads as a base layer that my dad just had. And we did not even get her full bouquet in there. At, at the end of it, I took a picture of the foliage that was left and was like, are you good if this goes in compost? Because uh, <laughs> eight bags later... Um, yeah, so those just need to stay covered for another few days. It says about a week, so like these guys will be done in about a week, but I think I'm just going to leave them in there for another week, uh, deal with it next weekend and see what's what. Um, but yeah, I wanted to see if these guys would also crispify because just of being enclosed in a space with such a dry environment. Um, but that's really what I was focused on this week so that I could get that done for Gabby. Uh, this weaving project is basically going to look the same until it's done. So <laughs> get a good look now. I'll update you when I'm closer to being done or when I'm ready to cut it off. But it's, it's a simple uh, hound's tooth so, two of color A, two of color B on the warp, and the same on the weft. I'm kind of doing it low contrast. I think the camera is making it a higher contrast than it is. Um, just because of how much light is in the room right now. But that's probably the last you'll see of that for a while. today. Hello, it's Saturday, March 28th, and uh, I think I'm gonna round up this vlog um, this morning, this afternoon, it's almost two o'clock, um, with just kind of catching you guys up on my works in progress and finished objects. I think I'm gonna release this a vlog style episode as a regular episode, so there will be show notes uh, over at freakishlemon.com and all the things that I usually say. Um, but I don't think I'm going to go into as much detail for each item, just because this is kind of vlog style and we don't want me to ramble on for another 45 minutes about everything that I've made. Um, or at least I don't want to do that because that would not be fun to edit at the end of a vlog style video. So we are sitting in a finished object. I've got a hat because I don't know what the hair is doing and I'm not worrying about it. And this backlighting might be an issue later, but we're gonna pretend that it's not for the time being. So this is my Redford sweater. It's patterned by Julie Hoover. I converted it to knitting on the machine except for the collar and the cuffs and there will be a separate video about it later. Uh, all in all, I'm super happy about it. I did have to play yarn chicken because of my initial four swatches, but now I know that 
five skeins of Green Mountain Spinnery Sock Art Lana is enough for a sweater if I don't have to make more than two swatches. That's the key. Um, so there's that. And then I also promised showing you my finished wedding outfit for Gabby's wedding. I didn't bother grabbing the shoes out. They're black leather boots. Um, these are the trousers that I already had, which are covered in fluff, um, that I kind of based the outfit around, because I knew I was going to wear these trousers. They're kind of charcoal gray, they're a wool, um, twill trouser. <clears throat> That's probably more accurate. It's, um, this backlighting's messing with the lighting, but... I made, to go with it, this shirt, uh, this is the Simplicity shirt, details will be in the show notes. Um, the only difference uh, is that I don't do the top button and the collar because I never button it, so why bother? Why wasting a button? And I also opted to do two small buttonholes in the cuff sides for cuff links since I also, most of the time, roll up my sleeves, um, why put buttons in my sleeve cuffs? Just put button holes and I'll use cuff links because it was a formal occasion, so hooray. Um, this is just, um, I think it's Kona cotton. It, I got it at Joann's. Um, this was one of Gabby's wedding colors. <sighs> interrupted by my Home Depot dirt delivery. Because <laughs> I gotta get seed starting for the garden. Now wish. Um, yes, so the main piece that I was really working on for Gabby's wedding is this vest. Um, this is in her wedding colors with a light gray, this dark red, and black. Um, not that the black was visible, it's a lining. Um, and I've got some video footage of making these two items, so I might just put that in at the end. Um, I decided while filming these items I wasn't going to do separate project videos on them, because it was just a lot. Um, but yes, it's got these fake pearl buttons. Um, and there's the bottom of the vest. There's no pockets in this vest. This is the only real regret I have for this vest. Um, just a couple of other tweaks that I would change is I would change this seam to be more here because that comes down a little low on me. Um, so I'm going to make a note on my pattern for that. And also this side seam is a little too curved. Um, so I would just extend this seam line down here so it was more of a straight side seam. Uh, I did have uh, considerable fit issues with this pattern because this is the medium which fit well from the shoulders to about my bust and then it was way too small. It was Captain America Dorito shaped. I had to end, I ended up, um, I did end up changing these darts. There's one dart, there's one dart in the pattern, there's two darts in my version. Um, I did have to widen the first dart and then the second dart was kind of more for shaping um, just because human bodies are not nice even rectangles. Um, but I, I think I ultimately ended up adding about six inches at the widest part of the vest, which is a lot. To add, but I think if I went a size up, I would have had a lot more fit issues at the top and it would have been a nightmare. So, this took me a while. Um, but everybody at the wedding was very impressed. I was quite pleased with that. Um, Gabby's maid of honor, uh, Carrie, was apparently my, my hype man <laughs> for the evening, telling everybody that I made <laughs> my shirt and my vest so that they would call me over and I could talk about sewing things with them. It was very strange, but um, pretty darn cool. Um, 
so I think now that the wedding's over and done with, I may add watch pockets into that vest once I learn how to do welt pockets um, because I do have pocket watches that I want to be able to wear with my vests. Um, there were no pockets in the original pattern, it was just like a fake welt piece. Um, so there's like a placement to put a pocket, but I, I'd have to learn how to do welt pockets, which I think I will do for the next vest that I make. I do have plans for a black linen one, kind of a more everyday wear type of vest. Um, I finished plying everything from the big wheel, so I'm not going to give you huge amounts of details, um, just because it'll take forever, but I wanted to show you kind of what the accumulation of my plying party bobbin extravaganza actually looks like, because it's a bit absurd. So, um, this is in no particular order, because it's whatever ended up in the box. This one just happens to be the last one, uh, because this one was still, it's still a little bit damp. Um, this is, did I throw the tag in here? Yes. Uh, this is Mad Color Fiber Arts, um, Life is Short and You Are Hot, with a fractal ply. I have no numbers for this. It's a two-ply, and it's lovely, and it's still a bit wet, so I'll just spread that out over there. Um, actually, before I start taking all of these out, let me show you. This is a storage cube. It's your standard Target storage cube. I think they're 11 by 11, typically. And it's nearly full. So, we've got this one. We've got this one. This is two different fibers. One is a Falkland Merino that I got out of a No Makers D stash way back when that I hand dyed myself. Um, and the other is uh, somebody else's D stash. It's, I think it's Phoenix Fiber Co. Um, but it's a light blues. Focus on the yarn, please. Um, one ply has a lot of silk content and the other has none. So I wanted to see what kind of weird drapiness that would do. And then the Falkland, um, hand dyed by me, had a lot of extra, so I just applied it back on itself. This is the mystery fiber that I found in my stash, going through my stash. It's green wood fiber works. Uh, the colorway is mallard, as in the duck. Uh, this was also a fractal ply. And it's super sparkly. I don't know if you can tell on camera, but it is very sparkly. Um, what else? Oh, I have a ton of classy squid because I love classy squid. This is a cuttlefish, which I may have shown on the podcast before, but it was part of my playing party. This is the Raven King, which is not going to show up great on camera because of my backlighting. But it's uh, black, brown, purple, green, and blue. There we go. That's a little better. Another classy squid. This is Quoth. Um, one ply is version one, and one ply is version two. Uh, version one of the versions has a lot more of the like mulberry silk and those types of add-ins. The other one is mostly just wool, different blends of wool. Uh, any more classy squids? No. I have a series of um, self-blended fibers um, that I did the singles on my electric eel nano wheel. Uh, there is House Organa. Uh, which is a blend of stuff that I don't recall off the top of my head, but it's brown, white, and blue. There is the 501st, uh, based off of the colors of the 501st Legion, uh, in the Clone Wars TV show, because they paint blue things on their armor. 
and then just a basic gray and yellow. Um, I think I had made these into Rolex. I don't remember. Um, it's just spare fiber I had um, in my blending fiber bucket. None of that is like necessarily labeled except to mostly uh, what the fiber content is. It It's just a bunch of stuff that's for blending. Um, and then I finished the last of my brown Cormo sweater spin. These two skeins were singles at the very start of, it was probably two years ago, um, this round of filling up all the bobbins. So that is a ton of yarn that I have plied in the past month. Um, So I have clear bobbins. Uh, at this point, I have a new bobbin on my wheel um, with a loop fiber bump uh, started and I have the Gotland and Perindale blend, I think it is, uh, on my electric yale nano, but that's just the light gray and super boring. And I just started the the loop bump this morning so it's like this much fiber on the uh, um, bobbin is the word I'm looking for. Alright so then just a quick check in with my hand knitting projects. This is the City Limits pullover by Samantha Garen Designs uh, where I have altered the ribbing a bit to make it a shorter ribbing. That's how far I've gotten. I last showed it to you at this point, and I've done some stockinette. Super exciting. Um, yeah, this one's not uh, in heavy rotation at this point because the deadline for this is um, October. So that's not a huge uh, concern. I have put some time in on my Cozy Memories blanket uh, because due to global pandemic, I've been working from home, which means a lot of conference calls where nobody can see me knitting on things. So where are, okay. So I've got a couple of squares down this end of things. And then I've got a couple of squares up here. And I've got a couple of squares up here. Um, I think once I get everything stair-stepped properly, then I will take note uh, in my tracker and find out what percentage I'm at uh, with this blanket. I've also been kind of switching between that blanket and this um, scrap pinwheel squares um, I did finish this one since last you saw this project uh, those ends need to be woven in and I don't remember if you saw this one but this one's also finished so I have four squares with completed knitting I need eight total squares uh, to make seat covers for my car. I'm holding the yarn double, but I'm using the same numbers from the uh, pattern by Mina Phillip. Do, 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 do. This one I've really been trying to get focused on. This is the Rice Fields Shawl by... I don't remember who it's by. It'll be in the show notes. Um, I'm in the second to last section. So it's two color brioche. Sort of semicircular shawl. Where's my little progress keeper? We last checked in at about there. 
Um, so now I'm in this section, and the the trouble with this shawl is that each new section you do, you double the amount of stitches, and there are more rows to complete in two color brioche, which I do in two passes because I'm not going to bother to learn one pass two color brioche this far into this shawl. Um, so I have one more section of this Winnie Sanderson colorway, and then w one last section of Spellbook, which is the green, and uh, then I'll be done. Um, I think I'll be, oops, super excited to have this off the needles to wear around. I'm just at Slog City because it takes so long to knit this many stitches. I don't know how many stitches it is, but it is a lot of stitches. And I'm getting tangled. And then... I haven't worked on that sock. Um... I did a teeny bit of spinning on these weird, um, unicorn roll eggs I have, um, that I made myself, but I haven't done a ton of spinning on it. I forgot I even had it. It was buried in the bottom of my whip basket. So I'm going to try to put some time in on that in the coming weeks. Um... And then my crochet granny square blanket, just around and around. Um, is there a progress keeper on this somewhere? If there was, there doesn't seem to be one now. All right, but I've started in on the second ball of Noro Ito. Um, and we'll see where we get by the time I finish the third one. I may need another one or two because the as it gets bigger it's going to eat up more and more yarn. Um, but I will contact uh, one of my local yarn stores about that if and when that time comes uh, because in global pandemic land, all the yarn stores are basically closed to the public, deliveries only, some stores um, are doing shopping by appointment so that there's only you and the shop owner in the store at the same time to practice social distancing uh, and all that good stuff. Um, so let's get all this back into this basket. And let's talk a little bit about other stuff, because uh, that's kind of the stuff that we're all clamoring for at the moment uh, here, because we are just kicking the camera, um, pretty much uh, shelter in place, at least in Connecticut is shelter in place. Um, yeah, so I'm not watching anything. Um, I'm in a cycle where my brain only wants audio uh, things and no video things, which is really annoying because I just got caught up on YouTube stuff uh, last week and now my brain's like, no, video is not for you. Goodbye. So um, I'm watching nothing. Um, but I'm listening to a ton. Uh, stuff I am listening to. I started listening to uh, the Rusty Quill Gaming Podcast. Um, I've listened to the Magnus Archives for a long time. Um, I think I started just after season one, beginning of season two. Um, but they've recently um, kind of exploded. Uh, <laughs> With the end of season four, the fan base just kind of blew up overnight and suddenly my entire Tumblr feed was listening to the Magnus Archives. It was super weird. Um, 
And then a few of them were doing what I normally do, but hadn't, which is listen to all the podcasts on that network. So I started with Rusty Cool Gaming. It's an actual play RPG podcast. Um, most people are familiar with uh, actual play podcast Critical Role. No, it's really good. They're using um, Pathfinder as a system because it was pre D and D five E. So uh, it's really funny listening to current episodes because there, <laughs> a couple of them who play five E and other games are just like five E handles this better. <laughs> and it's like, but they started with Pathfinder back in twenty fifteen. So. Um, yeah, and it's, it's coming up on Endgame for that podcast, but it's really very good. Um, they handle a lot of things really well, and there's a lot of fun, um, specials where they do shorter one-off games with special guests. Um, also from, uh, Rusty Quill is the podcast Stellar Firma. Uh, which sounds weird in my accent because it rhymes if you're British. <laughs> um, but it's a comedy, sci-fi, improv podcast about designing planets, basically. Um, it's really funny, and you should listen to it. Um, I re-listened to the the entirety of the Magnus Archives, because everybody was talking about the Magnus Archives, and uh, I couldn't remember who some of the characters were. I had forgotten uh, that Mike Crew existed, and was very confused why everybody was giving Johnny, sh Johnny Sims shit on Twitter for naming all his characters Michael. I could only remember the spiral, Michael. <laughs> I was like, this is awkward. <laughs> I've forgotten entire swathes of characters, um, so I re-listened to that. Uh, which, it's a lot more coherent when you listen to it all in one go. Probably why I forgot whole characters, because, you know, when you're listening to it in real time, some of those breaks, kind of, you forget stuff. Um, I'm now working through um, Outliers, um, which is a podcast that they do in association with um, Historical Royal Palaces. Um, Historical Royal Palaces provides research and um, actual historical information for um, palaces and people, uh, famous and non-famous people who lived in those palaces, and Outliers is a series of short stories about um, people involved with historical events in those palaces. Not necessarily people you will have heard of, um, but um, interesting perspectives. Um, there are, you know, there are some fictional liberties taken because of gaps in our historical knowledge, uh, but it's uh, really good and it's structured in such a way that you get a story in one episode and then the next episode um, Alex, the CEO, interviews the um, writer of that story and and how they, why they decided to do that story and, and how they filled in any gaps or how they came about to the story that they chose, um, which is really cool. And then, yes, and then I started um, the McElwraith, the McElwraith Statements, um, which is another supernatural ghosty podcast, um, the protagonist of whom is a Scottish woman named Sarah who can see ghosts. I enjoy spooky ghost podcasts sometimes. Um, I started listening to Hardy Dice Friends. Um, one of the hosts, um, Grant Howitt, um, has been a guest on Rusty Quill Gaming a bunch of times because he designs role-playing games. Uh, 
and he's hysterical, so I decided to listen to his podcast with his friend Chris, where they answer uh, RPG questions you have, whether you want them to or not. <laughs> um, it's mostly tangents and very few answers, which is delightful. Um, I've listened up um, through the current episodes of Palimpsest, which is... Um, it's a fiction podcast. It can be a bit spooky, um, but it kind of depends on which season you're listening to. Uh, each season is one story, uh, and the stories don't necessarily have anything to do with each other, but it's really good. The first season was um, a woman who was seeing ghosts and solving the mystery of these ghosts in her new apartment. Um, the second season was a woman who was basically became the personal servant of um, a fae who was trapped in like a... It was sort of like a, a human circus type of deal, but this man had trapped all of these fae in this house and then put them on display for exhibit. Um, and how badly things can go when you decide to free them all and they have no rules once they're freed from that house. Or they have, you know, their particular rules, but the human beings that they decided to prey upon don't necessarily know those rules. The current season is um, a former World War II co code breaker who is seeing um, dead people around London. And they keep telling her things. And she's trying to figure out what's going on. So it's pretty cool. Uh, and then I started Critical Role. I say started loosely. I've listened to two episodes. Um, these early episodes are rough. Um, I, th I, I know I've been spoiled for audio entertainment for, uh, real play or actual play RPG podcasts. I used to listen to Critical Hit back in the day, which is the, um, Dungeons and Dragons actual play podcast put on by the crew at Majorspoilers.com. And they were very, very focused on audio quality. Each individual person was miked. Um, and... Um, I, I remember very, you know, very good editing so that there wasn't a lot of crosstalk. There wasn't a lot of just shuffling stuff around while you figure out what to do. Um, and, uh, Rusty Cool Gaming is very good about, um, limiting crosstalk, um, so that people aren't talking over each other. Each individual person is miked, um, if they really mess up. Um, Alex will make them stop and repeat themselves and they will edit, uh, it together, um, because there are bloopers at the end of Rusty Quill Gaming where they've either really flubbed it or they just go off on a tangent that has nothing to do with, um, what's going on in the actual gameplay. Um, so these early episodes of Critical Role are... It's not clear whether they're individually mic'd or if there's just, like, group mics, but it's clearly just the audio ripped out of a live stream, which is hard to pay attention to. Um, there was, in the last episode, when they were buying wares from a merchant, there was three different conversations happening. Um, and it was... It's hard for me to follow. And also, you don't start at episode zero. These characters are already, like, mid-campaign. <laughs> so I'm hoping that will improve. Uh, but, um... But it's not, like, top of my priority to listen to right now. Because it's clearly not formatted for audio specifically and that may just be the case throughout the whole thing because I know it is a video a video thing that they do um and then a couple of Lord of the Rings podcasts I started and 
caught up with uh, Speak, Friend, and Enter, which is a Lord of the Rings deep dive podcast. It's put on by two sisters, one of whom is a huge fan of the movies, and the other is a huge uh, fan of the books. And the sister who is obsessed with the movies asks qu clarifying questions of the sister who um, is a huge fan of the books. So it's stuff like... Um, like, how long does it take Gandalf? How, how much time is there between Gandalf leaving Frodo in the Shire and him getting to Minas Tirith? And then an explanation of how distances in Middle, work, Middle Earth works. Um, and then, um, I can't remember their names. The sister who does the books also does these um, deep lore episodes where she just tells you some deep lore stories, like the creation of Middle-earth, um, who the the Valar are, who the Maiar are, in kind of colloquial terms and not, um, you know, the academic language of the Silmarillion. <laughs> that kind of thing. Uh, and then the unexpected, an unexpected podcast, Talking Tolkien, uh, which is two guys um, who are teachers in their 30s who are basically rereading The Lord of the Rings as a book club. Um, and it, that's actually got me into listening to uh, Fellowship of the Ring um, unabridged um, for the first time. That narrator is ace. I don't have it written down. I'll put it in the show notes. Um, I've listened to dramatizations of The Lord of the Rings uh, in audio format, but I haven't just straight up listened to the book, so I caught up to, um, the episode that I was listening to, so I'm going to listen to a chapter and then listen to the podcast where they discuss the chapter, uh, going forward, because it, they do some really fun deep dives on, um, Lord of the Rings. And then... I'm going to skip over stuff I'm reading because I haven't really read anything in the past month. So that'll probably do it for this vloggy type episode thing. Um, so see you in the next episode.